Jose Antonio Elena Rodriguez was 16 when he was killed with a bullet through the head by the United States Border Patrol. Nine more shots went into his body as he lay on the ground in his hometown, Nogales, Mexico. The bullets, fired from the top of this cliff in Arizona, traveled through an international boundary and into a legal vacuum. The agent has never been named. Jose Antonio was found on a sidewalk. The reports clearly indicate that he did not have any type of weapon in his hand, any type of rock, any type of nothing. He had a cell phone in his pocket. Why did the Border Patrol shoot Jose Antonio Elena Rodriguez? And why are questions involving his death met with silence? Tonight, Fault Lines examines the nation's largest law enforcement agency and asks who is holding them accountable when they pull the trigger. People here call this Ambos Nogales, or both Nogales. But a steel fence built in the name of national security divides this border town. I've come to meet Jose's family. They live just blocks from where Jose was killed. Yo creo que no quiero aceptar todavía que ya no lo voy a ver. Entonces yo en mi cabeza yo me hago como que aunque no está como que fue, no sé, anda de viaje. A Diego le ha afectado mucho, mucho, mucho. His brother Diego worked at a shop in the center of town. Jose would often meet him to help mop the floor before closing. That night, he never made it. Ya me decía que algo estaba mal. Pues era mucho movimiento el que había por por lo que había pasado, pero no sabía si era él. En la mañana yo me di cuenta por el periódico, pues tuve que aceptarlo. Está más claro que el agua, ¿me entiende? No, eso es un cobardía. Todo eso fue cobardía también. Jose Antonio was shot to death right on this street corner. The walls on this doctor's office are still riddled with bullet holes. Now, the Border Patrol's explanation for what happened hinges on the fact they say their agents were threatened by somebody throwing rocks on this side of the fence. But standing here, the first thing you ask yourself is could a 16-year-old boy really threaten somebody standing on top of what's at least a 20-foot cliff and on the other side of that fence? Whatever took place here that night, there are video cameras right there, which recorded everything that happened. But the Border Patrol and federal investigators have refused to share that surveillance video. So we're left to piece together the clues. On the night Jose died, the Nogales, Arizona police report describes border agents pursuing two different young men as they climb the fence back into Mexico. At the same time, on the Sonoran Street below the fence, Isidro Alvarado happened to be walking home from work. La noche esa en la banqueta aquí enfrente de mí caminaba un muchacho este la persona. Al llegar aquí donde estaba un cruzar aquí donde estaba un estacionamiento un poquito atrás se me atraviesan dos muchachos corriendo y volteo yo para arriba para junto a Agüero están haciendo disparos hasta esta persona cuando este muchacho cayó muerto le siguieron tirando ah está 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 ahí están siguieron disparando. So where were the agents when you saw them firing? Ahí ahí estaba uno haciendo los disparos para acá y acá estaba el otro acá eran dos dos agentes de borde. So it would seem the agents meant to fire at the fleeing men a questionable use of force to begin with. But Isidro says Jose was just walking down the street as the boys ran away. Este muchacho nunca traía piedras, ni se vio más gente, ni piedras por ningún lado. Son mentiras los de la versión que da Border Patrol. Attorney Roberto Montiel took us to the spot the agents fired from on the U.S. side. There is no way that the officer that was on top of this hill was in any kind of danger. Uh, first of all, you, I don't think you can hurl a rock from where Jose Antonio was over an 18-foot fence, which is pure steel. If this was 15 shots fired into and at a young man who was just walking down the street, how do you describe that? 
What is it that took place here? At best, it's a negligent homicide. At worst, it could be a, a murder. quería saber de nada. De todas maneras, yo decía, no me lo van a devolver. Pero mucha gente empezó a decirme que por qué no hablaba, que por qué no... Entonces dije yo, no, esto no se puede, o sea, no puede pasar como con el muchachito barrón, como con... porque es aquí mismo en Nogales. O sea, ahí quedó el caso y ahí quedó. Jose's death is part of what appears to be a disturbing new trend. U.S. Border Patrol agents shooting across the line to kill Mexican citizens in their own country. Selma Berenice Baron Torres's son Ramses was also killed by an agent in Nogales in 2011. <laughs> The U.S. government closed the investigation. Selma says she was never contacted. In 2012, Guillermo Arevalo Pedrosa was picnicking on the banks of the Rio Grande when he was killed by agents. He died in his nine-year-old daughter's arms. Juan Pablo Perez Santillan was shot near Matamoros just two months earlier. In 2011, in Tijuana, a witness says Jose Alfredo Yanez Reyes was killed for using his cell phone to record an agent beating a migrant. And Sergio Hernandez Guerica was shot between the eyes under a bridge in Juarez. In each case, the Border Patrol justified the killings, saying they were threatened by rock throwers. But getting them to speak on the record about anything at all proved difficult. Hi, Bill. This is uh, Wap Canoe calling from Al Jazeera English. We're down in Nogales, Arizona right now, so I'm just calling to see if we would be able to arrange an interview uh, and a ride along with uh, an agent out here. No. Uh, I had already told her that we just could not accommodate to request this time. We've sent emails about uh, starting about six weeks ago. We turned it down. And why is that? I don't mean to be adversarial about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we went through the proper procedure. Right, it just seems a little opaque, like I'm just trying to understand why the request was declined. What's happened is that the Border Patrol, being one of the largest law enforcement agencies in the country, they work with a population that doesn't work back with them. I mean, they're not like a police force that's in the same community that has to deal with residents that are upset, that can vote, and sort of mobilize against them. It's, it's a population that almost everyone is going to be kicked out, going to wind up in Mexico. And because of that, there hasn't been um, any ways in which they have to modify their activities, so there's almost no oversight, which is compounded by this idea that this is part of national security. When someone looks at a case like Jose Antonio Elena, you're like, this does not have anything to do with national security, right? This doesn't. In the twilight hours when most of the country is sleeping, we are out there. After 9-11, the Border Patrol rewrote its mission. It is the job of the Border Patrol to prevent terrorists from entering the United States. There was a huge push to hire agents and build up the force on the border. So the government produced these flashy promo videos, spent millions of dollars sponsoring a race car, and recruited heavily at professional bull riding events in an effort to fill the hiring quotas. To speed the build up, job requirements were lowered. No need to graduate high school, or even get a GED. And customary lie detector tests and screenings were deferred or ignored. Even defenders of the Border Patrol admit this was problematic. It was so fast that they were hiring people and not, they weren't able to complete the background investigations before these people started working on the job. That was crazy. Mandatory training was reduced from five months 
to 58 days. And hold it in steady. Especially impacting Spanish instruction. The agency is now twice the size it was in 2004. We protect America. Are you up to the challenge? Art Del Cueto is a Border Patrol agent and president of the Tucson chapter of the largest Border Patrol union in the country. Though his agency won't meet with us, he's agreed to talk to us off-duty. We're the first line of defense for the country. If I wasn't an agent and I did not work for the, for the United States Border Patrol, I would want somebody out here that had a little bit of a raw-raw attitude where he really truly took his job serious and wanted to defend the country. That's my view on it. So there's been a few officer-involved shootings at the border that have gotten a lot of attention lately. A 16-year-old guy on the Mexican side, Jose Antonio, and he was shot by a Border Patrol agent uh, from the U.S. side. Mm -hmm. Does that trouble you? Well, <clears throat> we, have, we have several shootings. I, I can't freely speak about that one because I think they're still looking into it. Uh, what people don't understand, and they say rocks, uh, the agents were rocked. I don't know what people's concept of a rock is, but uh, it's huge rocks. It's not these little rocks, it's huge rocks. In, in, uh, in areas that are populated like closer to Nogales, at times what they throw, it's chunks of cement that are broken off the sidewalk. Uh, it's, it's, it's a dangerous job. There have been 16 deaths of Border Patrol agents in the last five years. 13 of those were accidents. Two agents struck by a freight train one died when his vehicle hit a bull. Another was killed by friendly fire. In five years, three were killed through assault. There was a systematic study done a couple of years ago that Border Patrol has lower incidents of violence used against them than municipal police departments. Statistically, the more than 20,000 agents who patrol the country's border have one of the safest law enforcement jobs in the country. In fact, one of the larger problems is boredom. It doesn't mean that it's never dangerous. There are bandits out there, there are drug organizations out there. What they're not really getting is preparation for the boring, non-risky reality of almost all of their career. This can lead to lethal overreactions, says Heyman, who's been studying the use of force within the Border Patrol for much of his career. You build up this urge to do something, this desire to be, you know, effective, a can-do type of, of officer. Instead of having a lot of learned routines for how to handle a situation without risk to others, uh, instead you have this kind of instinctive excitement. He says they aren't trained to de-escalate or pull back out of risky situations. And for those living along the border, this can mean the difference between life and death. In 2010, Agent Jesus Mesa shot Sergio Hernandez Guerica under this bridge on the edge of Juarez, Mexico. The US-Mexico border runs through the middle of the canal. Sergio and some of his friends who live on the Mexican side of the border uh, often were in that dry ravine, um, and they were there on that summer evening as well. A witness filmed what took place with a cell phone. Bobby McDowell was on the bridge that day too, and later provided this sworn statement to attorney Bob Hilliard. A border patrol agent grabbed a hold of the one that basically came into his arms and he had his weapon in his right hand and his, the young man in his left hand. I was very, very worried, and I didn't feel that it, there was any reason for him to have pulled his gun. He started firing his weapon into Mexico. Border Patrol guy aims, and you hear two shots. Uh, and one hits Sergio right between the eyes. After the shooting stopped, I'm looking around and I see that there's someone on the ground underneath the black bridge. And I remember saying, my husband, is that a body? And he says, yes. So there's no indication that there was something to justify lethal force? There's a fabricated FBI report that came out the very next day 
uh, before they realized there was a video that claimed the Border Patrol agent was surrounded and being pelted by rocks and in fear for his life. Hilliard read this FBI statement to Bobby during her sworn testimony. This was her response. That was not true. There was no one surrounding him throwing rocks. What happened next points to a problem unique to killings that cross international lines. Sergio's family tried to sue the agent who shot their son, but the federal judge in El Paso dismissed the case. Though the bullet traveled from the U.S., it landed in Mexico. The United States Constitution and any accountability did not travel with it. You have a, a child whose family cannot seek redress within the civil justice system for that conduct. And it occurred only because of the vacuum, which is our border. It's like walking out into the wild, wild west, and you're standing there at high noon, and whatever you do is not reviewed anymore. Cross-border killings by Border Patrol agents and complaints over a culture of abuse within the agency have spurred ongoing protests along the border. We're following protesters as they march to the site where 16-year-old Jose Antonio was killed in Nogales. But as in other cross-border killings, the agent may never be tried, since Jose died on the other side of the international line. No one from the Office of Inspector General, FBI, or Attorney General's office will tell us if the agent is still on patrol. And even getting answers about when and how agents are trained to pull the trigger is difficult. Unlike most law enforcement agencies, the Border Patrol's use of force guidelines are not made public. Copies obtained through Freedom of Information Act requests are heavily redacted. But attorney Jim Kaye, who represents agents accused of misconduct, including cross-border shootings, says there's nothing to hide. In the vast majority of these cases, it's very clear cut in the sense of there is a deadly force threat made against an agent, and the agent has to resort to, to the use of deadly force in response. Border Patrol agents are subject to f at least five levels of scrutiny uh, every time they pull the trigger. Their conduct is so scrubbed, you know, by the time two years and three years pass, which is sometimes the length of time that it takes for these investigations, you know, to wrap up. Because it takes so long, people think the process is corrupt. They think that agents don't have, to, you know, have no accountability for their use of deadly force. People start to speculate. And look, Border Patrol, they can pull the gun and shoot and kill people and it doesn't matter. But former Border Patrol agent Ephraim Cruz says a lack of accountability is actually the crux of the problem. He was an agent for almost 10 years in the Tucson sector. Disturbed by what he described as a pattern of cruelty among his colleagues, withholding food from migrants in custody, needless crowding, name calling, he started reporting abuses to his superiors. He says he was met with silence, framed, and eventually forced to resign. No one from the U.S. Border Patrol, Office of Inspector General, U.S. Attorney's Office, Customs and Border Protection, DHS, Congress, has reached out to me. This is a senior Border Patrol agent, one of their guys, reporting observed abuses of detained migrants. What do you think they're going to do when it's an outsider? Do you feel as though allowing those less serious forms of abuses paves the way for the more lethal officer-involved cases? When they see there's no consequence for, wrong, for, for, for misdeeds, then they think, if I get myself into a situation out in the field, I can do whatever the hell I want. 
And what you see is the delay tactic. Answers such as the, the investigations are ongoing and pending. And what eventually happens is you find yourself mired in the investigation is forever going. And do you believe that that's a deliberate tactic? Purposeful. Absolutely. Here in Nogales, the San Juan Bosco Center is a short-term refuge for recent deportees who arrive by the dozens every day. Their stories of trying to reunite with family or find work are vivid reminders of why so many risk their lives at the border. Here at San Bosco, Hannah Hafter helps deportees like Santos Salinas who have been separated from loved ones or who have health issues. She sees the rise in cross-border shootings as a symptom of larger issues within the Border Patrol. The kinds of situations that we see in Border Patrol are beyond what, we, what people could invent. It's everything from literally being like punched and kicked to being forced to hold uncomfortable positions for no reason for hours at a time um, to being pushed into a cactus or pushed down a hill in a way. And she says the problem goes all the way to the top is that we submit complaint after complaint after complaint to the Department of Homeland Security and we get form letters saying that they've been received and there's really no outcome to exposing the abuses within the system. We're heading to the Custom and Border Patrol headquarters in Washington, D.C. right now. We've been trying for months and months to get an interview with anybody from the organization, and we've been unsuccessful. So we're going to try our luck at the door. We've spotted one of the men we've been trying to reach, first in command, Thomas Winkowski. Hey, Mr. Winkowski. What we're looking at is a case of uh, officer-involved shootings at the Mexican uh, okay. line. And uh, we'd like to know, why is it that uh, rock throwing justifies? Give me a card and no. Why is it the rock throwing justifies the lethal use of force? I'll do it. I'll have a Literally for field. six months, okay. we've been asking Michael Quick. and Jenny both to speak to us. Okay. And they haven't gotten back to us. Okay. And we're on a deadline today, which okay. is why we're up here, and we're actually okay. trying to get an answer from you today. He said he, he uh, would pass it on to you guys and that uh, we could get an interview. The answer is no. We can't, we can't do this. Uh, we we want to help you as best we can, but he can't do the interview. The public affairs officers promised to answer written questions instead, but by the time we went to air, had failed to respond. People are investigating a lot right now whether or not Jose Antonio was involved in drug trafficking or crossing the border or throwing rocks. But the big question is really whether or not it should be OK to kill someone for trafficking drugs, or whether or not it should be able to kill someone for throwing a rock. And I think most people would say that, no, that's not OK. If you can't have that type of discussion because everything is behind this wall, behind this idea that this is about national security and stopping terrorism, then how are you supposed to be able to really provide security that's, that works for human beings? Jose's mother, Araceli, catches a bus to work just a block from where her son was killed, under the shadow of the fence. A constant reminder that her son's killer has not been brought to justice. Yo quiero verle la cara a las personas que mataron a mi hijo. Tenemos que saber quién fue. El caso de José Antonio, yo no sé cuánto tiempo vaya a llevar, pero yo voy a seguir luchando hasta que se haga justicia. Tienen que limpiar ellos mismos, los de la Border Patrol, limpiar su nombre. Porque si no enseñan la cara de los asesinos, 
todos los demás están embarrados. 